I mentioned this morning I spent a lot of time in airplanes, and something that used to really bother me when I was in airplanes was the same spiel they always give every time you get in an airplane. You know, they always tell you just in case the plane goes down, here's what's going to happen. And, you know, they talk about <clears throat> the, the mass, you know, come out of the ceiling. And then they always, this always bothered me. They always say, now, if you're an adult, don't put it on yourself, put it on the child first. And I thought, why are they, I mean, that's the other way around. Put it on yourself first, not the child. I've heard it so many times, I get it confused. You know, uh, and I used to always think, but no, you help your children, of course. And, but then realize that what they're saying was right, because how can we help our children if we're not taking care of ourselves first? And since you guys serve so much, and behind the scenes in so many ways, and life groups and behind the scenes and serving with Bobby and Wanda in so many ways, I want to share a few things that will help you be healthy and just help you. I've got four things I want to share with you that I think will really help you find health yourself. Because, you know, we love our neighbors as ourselves. And if we don't take care of ourselves, how can we help anybody else really effectively? So what I want to share with you is a scripture, a uh, very familiar scripture from Luke 2 and 52. It says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. So we see here, as Jesus began to grow and mature, there were four areas of his life that he grew in. And I believe we need to be intentional about these four areas of our own lives. Now, the first is, the Bible says here that Jesus grew in wisdom. Now, I want to talk to you a bit about being healthy this whole thing is about being healthy. And wisdom has to do with being healthy and staying healthy intellectually. Being healthy in a way we are constant learners. Never stop learning. Always learn. As long as there's life, we continue to learn. And because we want to be healthy in this area of our lives. Daniel, chapter 1, verse 17, and his three friends had knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning and the supernatural. So it's both, the supernatural and all kinds of wisdom. And if I have a Christian pilot, like, by the way, that pilot, you know, last week at Southwest Airlines, a lady was sucked out, but the pilot was a Christian, you know, and, and it was amazing how God used her, and she was, you know, I mean, she just did a fantastic job. But I'm sure she had more than Christian training. So I want an airline pilot. It's not just a Christian. I love when they're Christians. But I want them to have some training on airlines too, okay? So what I'm, what I'm saying is that I believe we need to, we need to focus on growing in wisdom in many areas of life. I love TED Talks. I love even, even if a TED Talk is something that I disagree with. I like it because these people are passionate about what they believe. And I'm always learning some little thing somewhere. Now, a key, I found that a key to learning and a key to growing in wisdom is ask lots of questions. Ask lots of questions. Now, why do I share that? I, I, because I find that people who ask questions are the ones who grow in wisdom. I remember as a young pastor, I was, I was asked to go to Christ Church, New Zealand, South Island. And again, I was a young pastor, and I was asked to speak on a Sunday night service in a church I had heard of because of this move of God that was there. And this, this pastor was this apostolic leader. He seen God do amazing things. I thought, I'm going to get a chance to go to this church, and I hope he's there so I can meet him and find out ask him questions, find out what, what's going on in his life. So I get there. I meet him in the beginning. He said, I want to talk to you. He said, after the service, we'll come down to this coffee shop. So we go to the little coffee shop in the bottom of their building after the service was over. I thought, here's my chance to ask him questions. We sit down and get our coffee. He says, now, Larry, he said, now tell me about this. He said, now, let me ask you questions about this. And let me ask him. He took the whole time and asked me questions. And I realized, I, mean, I was just a young kid. What did I know? But I realized, why is there such wisdom on this guy? He's always asking questions. I remember the first time I met Mike Bickle uh, many years ago before there was an IHOP. He'd always preach about IHOP, International House of Pancakes. He'd always preach about it. I remember that for years. And we go to the same conferences, and he'd speak about, there's going to be IHOP someday, you know. And, but I remember when I first met him, he said, now, we sat down, and he said, now, just tell me what you're doing. He was so intrigued by, we were doing cell groups back then. Said, tell me how this works. And asking questions, I thought, well, he's a man of wisdom. We get wisdom by asking questions. Jesus constantly asks questions. Who do men say that I am? Right? So why is this so important? Because one little bit of wisdom can change everything. Just one little thing. Paul Johansson was, the, for years, the president of Elam Bible Institute. And I remember one day Paul said, he was an early mentor to me way, way back in the day. 
And I remember he said he was on the way to Madagascar, I mean, on the way to East Africa. And with him on an airplane was a business guy who was going to Madagascar. He knew that because the guy asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm a missionary. He said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to Kenya, but then I'm going over to Madagascar. He said, why? He said, because you know, this is the day when they had big computers, no little computers, <laughs> big computers. He said, because there's a problem with one of our computers. He got a little, like, screwdriver out of his pocket. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Madagascar, get off the plane, go to our plant there, and make one little adjustment in, just one little adjustment, put it back in my pocket, get back in the plane, come back home. He went the whole way there for one little adjustment. And that's why, you know, as servant leaders, as you're giving out to so many other people, make sure that you're growing in wisdom in whatever area, area of life that is. Jesus, at 12 years of age, was just so sharp. You say, yeah, he was God. Yes, but... He had learned wisdom. He learned from his father and his heavenly father. In the first 30 years, interesting, Jesus did no public ministry to his mother, released him to do it at the wedding, but he was gaining wisdom. So, number one, let's stay healthy. Be intentional about finding ways. Watch more TED Talks or do whatever, whatever it takes. And again, Christian, obviously, yes, the word of God. Yes, the scripture. Yes, 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 yes. But just wisdom in life. God's called us to grow in wisdom. Number two. In stature. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. It has to do with staying healthy physically, and stature literally means growing in maturity. Growing in maturity. So, this earth suit that I have, the Billy has, this earth suit right here, the real Billy's inside the earth suit. And the reason he's here today is he's got an earth suit. So that's why we got to take care of ourselves. I mean, I mean, this stuff, I'm speaking to myself all the time. Like, you know, my wife and I, you know, that crazy life I live and airplanes and traveling and all these people forgive us wonderful food and all these things. Man, it's not an easy thing to take care of the earth suit. We got we get to take care of our earth suits also. Why? Because this is our ticket to stay on planet Earth. So stature, focusing on stature, staying healthy physically and growing in maturity and, you know, we all have personal convictions. Like, we were joking about coffee today. You know, I remember sometime back someone told me, they said, you shouldn't drink coffee because it's hard on your health. So I said, okay, I'm going to quit coffee. So I went to my doctor and said, I'm, gonna, I'm quitting coffee. He said, why? He said, it's hard on your health. He said, no, coffee's really important for you. You need to drink coffee. I'm saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> so I drink coffee again. <laughs> but I'm saying, you have to know how this applies to you. What works for one person is different for somebody else. Just figure out what works for you, and, and you can grow in stature. Now, remember, stature includes maturity. It literally means maturity. How do you model maturity? Well, here's one way. Ask yourself this question, and if you don't have the answer, ask somebody close to you. Do people feel safe around you? Do people feel safe around you? If we grow in maturity, I mean, great-grandpa who's, you know, been around forever, filled with love, Grandkids feel safe around great-grandpa. Do people feel safe? You say, I think they do, but I'm not sure. Well, ask somebody in your life. Ask your spouse if you're married, if you're single. Ask somebody who knows you well. Ask people you work with, people in your life group. Do people feel safe around, around me so we can know if we're growing in maturity? You know, uh, a few months ago, I took what's called a 360. I don't know if you know what that is. You probably would know. A 360 I had 17 different people uh, shared about me things that... They wanted to tell me this, about my leadership and how I respond to people, whatever. I really wanted that because, you know, yeah, I might be 67 years of age, but, man, I, I'm gonna, I want to keep learning as long as I live, and I want to grow in maturity as long as I live. And, it, and there were no real surprises. This thing came back, and someone sat down with me and said, yep, yeah, this is kind of what you probably would have expected. And, and, and yet there were areas that I could grow and be accountable and grow in maturity. So let's make sure that we also are staying healthy physically, and, you know, as I said, after 67 years, you kind of know your strengths. And you kind of know your weaknesses. But it's really good to know and get feedback into our lives. So as servant leaders, let's make sure we do something to focus on maturity. Now, as I go through these four areas, don't try to change everything at one time. Just pick one thing. Just one thing can change. Remember the little pen knife, you know, in Madagascar. Just make one change. Start somewhere. And that brings us to the third area. Jesus grew in favor with God. Now, what does that have to do with favor with God? That, to me, has to do with staying healthy spiritually and emotionally. I want to take a little more time on this. 
How do we stay healthy emotionally and spiritually when we're constantly serving? And I'm indebted to Pete Schizero. Laverne and I, on a sabbatical two years ago, read this book, The Emotionally Healthy Leader. I know he's there's some other books that you've read of his. And uh, I'm going to share with you a few things I learned from this that really helped me personally. I'm still, in, I'm still a man in process, still working through, through these, uh, these things. But favor with God, staying healthy spiritually, obviously has to do with our prayer life, has to do with time with God. Yes, all those things. But many times, Christians, especially faith Christians, charismatic Christians, miss the emotional side. You know, we're people of the word, hallelujah, we stand in the word, and we do. But there's still, there's this connection we have, to under, we have to understand why we feel what we feel, and feelings aren't all bad. Feelings often are, it will tell us if there's something going on in our lives. So, whether it's good or whether it's not good. So we learn to be still before God, we listen to God. My wife helps me with this. I mean, my wife, Laverne, is, as I said before, she's more of a, you know, listen to God, and I'm more of a doer, and God speaks to me as I'm doing. I'm learning to listen in ways I've never lear learned before. But I want to encourage you that you can learn from people who are different than you. My wife, Laverne, went to, she went to a, a silent retreat for women. It was led by nuns. <laughs> Catholic silent retreat. Billy, I'm saying, how do you do that for two days? Don't talk for two days, and you're a woman doing this? This is amazing. How do you do this deal? She loved it. It was a little transformative for her. And she began to teach me something she learned about how God was speaking in the midst of silence. Now, let me tell you a few things I learned from Peter. Not Peter in the Bible, Peter Schizero. A couple of things that helped me. Peter explains, he has, he has a church in New York City, that when you go to Manhattan and different parts of New York City, you see the big skyscrapers. He said the reason you can have those tall buildings is because they have these deep pillars, piles, go deep down in the ground to help hold that building up. He said, we often think of our outer life, and as we're ministering in life groups and all the outer life, what about the inner life? He said, they're like these pillars underground. You don't know they're there, but if they're not there and not working properly, it's all over for the building. Now, he mentions four. I'm just going to give them to you. This is, again, really helpful for me personally. He said, for us to have a healthy outer life, we have to have a healthy inner life. And he said, here's the four areas. Number one, he said, you must face your shadows. Every person has shadows. It's our background. It's our history. Uh, Robert Henderson, who's been at a conference, we call it the bloodline. Many different ways of looking at this. You've got to face your shadows. Because we all, we all have those shadows. We all have a past that affects us today. That's why I thank God for ministries of healing and restoration, whether it's, you know, restoring the foundations or, I mean, on and on, so many good ministries. But there's something about recognizing we all have shadows. I grew up with lots of shadows. You know, I, I grew up in a home where my father was mentally ill for a season. That was a shadow. And many of his family were mentally ill. And I told you that story here in past times. So we'll tell it again. That was a shadow in my life. And so we all have shadows, but we need to face them. And often we say, well, I'm just going to be this man of God, this woman of God, and do what he's called me to do without facing those things. Because when they come up, we need to face them and find healing and find grace and find wisdom that comes from that. Number two, he says you must lead out of your marriage or singleness. Let's get one thing straight. If you're single... You are whole. You don't have to be married to be whole. You are whole. And you think, some people think, well, I'm, I'm single, and someday I might, you know, get married, and then there'll be more holes. No, no, you are whole today. And we need to learn to, to lead as we lead. You're all leaders out of our marriage, focusing on having a strong marriage, and our singleness. Now, this is really enlightening for me, even though God's blessed us with a good marriage, et cetera. But we need to be healthy, married, or or healthy, single first. Because often we're doing the ministry stuff, and that's what we focus on. And then the marriage issues or the singleness issues, things we're dealing with in our lives, we say, well, we'll take care of that sometime in the future. And because of shadows we have in our lives, it just doesn't happen. So how do we become emotionally healthy? We'll talk about it in just a moment. The, the fourth, third area, he said the third pile in the ground, the inner life, is slow down for loving union with God. Yeah, slow down for loving union with the Lord. 
And the fourth area, he says, you must practice Sabbath. He calls it Sabbath delight. Because God six days worked hard, and even God took a break. Even God took a Sabbath. Now, according to Hebrews, obviously in the New Testament, there's this Sabbath rest for the people of God. We kind of live out Sabbath, and I agree with that, and I believe in that. It's like praying without ceasing. People say, well, I don't need to rig a time in prayer because I pray without ceasing. No, it's both. <laughs> it's both. But I believe that God wants to show us the importance of having Sabbath, and that was really an area that God spoke to me because even though with my crazy schedule, I was taking time, and that's different for everybody. Depending on job and setting, it might be a part of a day on a Saturday. It might be a, a, whatever. You, you have to find what works for, for you. For me, for years, it's been Thursday. But then I was doing all kinds of other stuff Thursday, and that really wasn't Sabbath. And I realized I needed to take more time. Now, let me just share this with you yet, because I want to take a little more time on this. I learned that an emotionally unhealthy leader has these symptoms. Are you ready? Here are some symptoms of an emotionally unhealthy leader. Now, this might be a good time to check out and listen to God if you don't want to hear this about your life. <laughs> An emotionally unhealthy leader has the following symptoms. Number one, they lack awareness of their feelings, weaknesses, and limitations. They, they lack awareness of their feelings, weaknesses, and limitations. They just don't know. And they just keep going and going and going without getting come to grips with that. Some examples of that is... They tend to be unaware of what's going on inside. You just kind of step it down. Just kind of, I'm not going to deal with it. God will take care of it. Or if they feel anger, they fail to process it. The Bible says be angry, but sin not. So they say, no, I'm just going to stuff it. I'm, I'm, I might be angry, but I don't know. And it, don't deal with it. It'll eventually come back up. It'll eventually come back up. Or... They lack the capacity and skill to enter deeply into the feelings and perspectives of others. So Billy sits down with me and opens his heart to me and shares what's going on in his life and some things that are very deep, and I don't even feel it. That's unhealthy. That's being unhealthy emotionally. And in just a moment, we'll talk about how do we deal with it. And then they're also unaware of how their past impacts their present. Many people just go on. They come to Christ and fill the Holy Spirit, but they don't deal with some of the emotional things they walk through. Now, so the, that's all has to do with lack of awareness of feelings, weakness, limitations. Number two, again, unhealthy leaders. Unhealthy, emotional, the unhealthy, emotionally unhealthy leader. Number two, prioritize ministry over their marriage and over their singleness. Healthy ministry comes out of marriage and singleness healthy. Now you say, well, I'm going through this hard time. God meets us exactly where we're at. I want you to know that. But at the same time, we need to recognize that often we can be involved in, in ministry in a way that we're not dealing with true issues in our lives. They invest the best of their time in becoming a better leader, invest little in cultivating a great marriage or a great singleness. And that can reveal Jesus to the world. Again, again, we just take what fits for you. Number three, they, again, this is all from Peter. It really helped me personally. That's why I'm sharing it with you. He says, because I found I was unhealthy in some of these areas, being honest, after all these years. And God began to deal with me in some of these areas. Number three, they do more actively for God than the relationship with God can sustain. He says they're chronically overextended. See, we can be doing all the things for God, but unless our relationship with God is deep, we can be chronically overextended because we can't sustain that. And they... Have it learned that doing for Jesus flows out of being with Jesus. Doing for Jesus flows out of being with Jesus. Now, I feel like I'm just dumping this all on you. <laughs> and yet, I think we need to at least be aware. And you can, you know, you can go online or you can, you know, there's others that can help you. If there's some things here you need to walk through, great. But I just want to at least tell you some things that God's been showing me has helped me with. Again, these are these deep, deep things. Number four, they lack a work Sabbath rhythm. And again, it looks different for everybody. I had to block extra time off of just, to, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Number four, I'm talking too fast. They lack a work and Sabbath rhythm. They're simply working a lot, but not enough Sabbath. 
not enough listening to God, not enough rest. And again, however that works for you. Uh, and it looks different for everyone. I had to block off ex some extra time because of my crazy schedule. I just had to do that. Or I could take a walk. And Laverne and I walk a lot. That's, that's one way we get refreshed. Uh, where I could simply um, just not be thinking about writing the next book or helping solve a problem in some part of the world. Where I could just focus on Jesus, focus on my family. Um, that's how that worked out for me. Sabbath includes stopping work, includes rest, delighting in God. And Pete says, pondering on the love of God. Let's think about how much we're already loved by the Father. Now you say, okay, I think I have some unhealthy stuff in my life. What do I do about it? Well, what do we do? And I don't have time to get into detail, but if we can focus on the four pillars I just mentioned and just take any of them, start with one, facing our shadow. Okay, let's get some healing of some things that may have happened in the past and I didn't come to grips with. And, you know, if you're involved in counseling, you probably often use the illustrations like an onion and you peel a little piece off and a little more off. And that's the way it works in God. God just takes us as far as we can handle at the time. And just start somewhere. Start with one thing. So face your shadow, leading out of your marriage or singleness. Slowing down for loving union with God and practicing Sabbath and Sabbath delight. Again, start somewhere. All right, my time is soon gone. I want to take time for questions. Um, number four is favor with man. Let me talk to you honestly about this one. Uh, favor with man has to do with staying healthy relationally and socially. Staying healthy relationally and socially. I am of the opinion and by the way, it has to do with our relationships, our family, church family, community, whatever. Again, our relationship connecting with other people. Again, being healthy relationally and socially. I am of the opinion that a tremendous key to be healthy in this area is to, as we mentioned briefly this morning, is to have a revelation of the grace of God. Because I found if we have a revelation of the grace of God, it's this free, unmerited favor of God. We just mentioned briefly today. And we receive the grace of God. If we have that revelation, we know that except by the grace of God, I can do nothing. Except by the, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I mentioned this morning, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. If we get that, it's going to change how we relate to people around us. And here's why. Because if I really understand the grace of God, I have a revelation of it, I can never be offended. I'm offense proof. You can't offend me. You can't because the only reason I'm not doing the same stupid thing is the grace of God. If I understand the grace of God, are you listening to me, Tim? Are you tuning out? Okay. Make sure you keep jabbing him. Okay. But if you're getting something from God that's better than this, take, take the God stuff. Okay. I'm with you. All right. Here's some more news for you. I will never gossip if I have a revelation of the grace of God. I'll never put somebody else down if I have a revelation of the grace of God. Now, I was here, I don't know, last year or the year before, I talked about the 12 D's of the devil. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, it's something I learned through a, I learned the essence of this through a Portuguese-speaking Portuguese pastor from Brazil. He talked about the seven D's of the devil. And I'm going to explain it in a minute because some of you heard it, some of you didn't. I think it was two years ago. I mentioned it briefly when I was here. And the 12 days of the devil basically comes from the scripture in Hebrews 12, 15. And it says, be careful that you do not fall short of the grace of God. Okay? Be careful you don't fall short of the grace of God. He says, and a root of bitterness does not spring up and defile many people. Defile many, it says, meaning people. Now, when we're in leadership of any way, whether it's small group leadership life group, you know, serving children, whatever we're doing. See, if, if I fall short of the grace of God, if Bobby does something that says something that's hurtful to me, and rather than saying, I love this man, and I may need to talk to him about it, but sometimes I don't even need to. I say, I love this man. I bless him in Jesus' name. I extend grace to him. In fact, I'd have said something a lot worse to him except for the grace of God. If I walk in the grace of God, guess what? I'm free. He's free. But if I don't, a little root of bitterness, of offense, is in my heart. A little root. 
Now, a little root you can pull out quickly, because then tomorrow morning I wake up and say, that was stupid. I love Bobby. He didn't mean anything. Even if he did mean something by it, it doesn't matter. I release him my blessing. Give him grace, Lord. I'm going to walk in grace free. And that little root's pulled out. But if I don't, that root starts to grow. And what's really scary is when we are involved in any kind of leadership, it will not just defile us, but the people we minister to. Even without saying anything, it's like having a bad smell. It gets in other people. Because of inflections, things we think, things we say, even without trying it. And that, I mean, I grew up a farm boy. I remember red roots. They were a little, little, little you just pull them right out. But they would grow them, and they would get really big. You would use a tractor to pull them out eventually. Because if you don't deal with it right away, it becomes a big root and defiles lots of people. They say, hey, what does that have to do with the 12 Ds of the devil? The first D of the devil is disappointment. Most problems we have, when we pick up an offense and we allow this root to grow, has to do with disappointment because of an unmet expectation. I thought that person in my small group was going to be here tonight and help me do whatever. Or I thought this person was going to lead this, lead this children's ministry. They went to another church or whatever. We have an expectation, and it's not met, and we are disappointed. Now, this little book here, Laverne and I wrote some years back, When God Seems Silent. We have a whole chapter on the deeds of the devil. I'll give this to somebody. It's chapter 7. Anybody want it? Chapter 7? There you go. Chapter 7 deals with it. I, I just tell you what they are. And, uh, I mean, I can give, I can give you note, more notes if you want that and give it to Bobby and Wanda. They can give it to you. I just quickly tell you what they are because here's how it works. If Bobby does something to me, I'll use Bobby as an example again, and I pick up the first disappointment, the first D of the devil. I'm disappointed, and I don't extend grace. What happens then is I go to the second D, which is discontentment. Now, I can forgive and release him, but I'm going to be discontent. Do you know that most church problems have to do with these Ds of the devil? Have to do with not releasing? Because there's always a doctrinal issue. Well, maybe sometimes, but often it's not. Often it's an unmet expectation. Somebody had things didn't go the way they thought. And rather than releasing it to God and listening to God and doing what he's called them to do, they're simply letting this, allowing this to build up. And the third D then is discouragement. You start to get discouraged. Again, any time you can turn back release, but it gets harder every time. But you can do it, but the root is bigger. It's harder to pull out. So number three is discouragement. Number four is doubt. You know, out of time to get into the details of this, but number five is disbelief. That's like the final form of doubt. Do you know that most cults started by Christians who love Jesus, who got disillusioned because of a disappointment, unmet expectation? We all have opportunities every day. And then six, disillusionment, seven, deception, eight, disobedience, nine, discord, ten, dysfunction, 11, despair, and you probably know what 12 is. It's destruction. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. The devil is out to destroy us. And that's just us. Destroy the call of God in our lives. But see, God wants us to walk in a place of wholeness, emotional wholeness, and wholeness in this area of favor, favor with God and with man, and we to stay healthy relationally and socially. We need to make sure that we receive the grace of God Forgive and walk on. I'm not saying we don't talk to people, confront people. I'm not saying we don't do it. But we do it with a heart of compassion, not because we're mad at them. So there you've got it. I'm going to open up for any questions. Four areas for leaders, four areas of staying healthy. Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew in stature, maturity. He grew in favor with God. And uh, obviously it had to do with with, uh, with being emotionally and spiritually strong and then favor with man. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for these amazing servants, you. And Lord, I pray that there be grace on our lives extended. Lord God, that we would be like Jesus and we simply would be intentional, starting with just one thing, just one thing. Intentional, Lord, about growing in these areas that we talked about, Lord God. As Jesus himself, as a young boy, grew, Lord God, 
he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. And we thank you, Lord, for a healthy, emotional leaders coming from Crossroads Community Church for the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.